Hi, I'm Mary Harrell for Tan Books. There's no question that the sacrament of matrimony is under attack. You may now kiss the bride has become, hey, we'll just get an annulment if it doesn't work out, right? And while it's easy to blame the outside culture for the disrespect of marriage and the demise of it, we've got to look at what's been happening inside the church as well. And that's just what author John Clark is doing with his new book, Betrayed Without a Kiss, Defending Marriage After Years of Failed Leadership in the Church. John is both an author and a speechwriter. He has authored two previous books on fatherhood and written hundreds of articles about Catholic family life and apologetics for the National Catholic Register, Seton Magazine, and Catholic Digest. John and his wife, Lisa, know just a, a little bit about marriage and family life. They have nine children and have been married going on three decades. My goodness. John, kick things off for us with that title. It takes some guts to say that the church has failed at any topic, but especially at defending marriage. Why do you make that claim? So um, it is a tough title, but I thought it was appropriate. And, you know, I came up with that title and a friend mentioned to me, he said, boy, that's that's pretty rough. And I thought, yeah, maybe I should think about that. But the more the research that I did, the more I thought that title was warranted. The problem is, is that um, we ultimately, uh, the, the argument I make in the book is this, that there are seven sacraments. But only one of them stands under what I call uh, unrelenting scrutiny. So none of us is ever really called upon to prove the validity of his baptism, right? I mean, I've never heard of that. Or uh, prove confirmation was correct. Or for that matter, how about a penance 20 years ago? Was it valid? And yet for matrimony, we're constantly trying to defend it. And I thought, you know, the church, in some sense, the church is a primordial sacrament. And we, the church needs to respect the fact that, you know, it has to uphold marriages, not, not find ways. And I'll give you a quick example, and I'm sure we'll get to this, but so let's say that my wife and I, after 30, we, uh, you know, 30, 31 years of marriage, uh, talk to a priest and say, you know, Father, I don't know if our marriage is valid. We're, we're thinking about an annulment. Is it possible? A standard response, and I don't know how many, what percentage of these responses would go this way, but the standard response is, well, let's get out a brochure about annulments. Let's see if you can check any of these boxes. That, that's a standard response. It's not reconciliation. Wow. And yeah, it's a pretty big problem. So I'll give you an example. So years ago, it wasn't, wasn't too long, maybe four or five years ago, there was a priest, I want to say in Arizona, but I'm not sure. The, the place doesn't actually matter. But there was a priest who came, uh, had been baptizing with the formula, we baptize you, we baptize you. Now, that's invalid because it's I, because the, the I meaning Jesus, right? So when the bishop found out that the priest had been doing this for apparently years, he sent out, almost almost frantically, uh, sent out a, um, an email or some you know, directive from, uh, from his office and said, look, if you've been baptized by this priest, come in and you know, let us know. We'll set something up because you need to be validly baptized. In other words, it's a pretty big deal to get the sacraments right, right? So why is matrimony treated differently? So if the same thing had happened, so if the same thing happens with couples, why are we pulling out the annulment brochures in the first place? Does that make sense? Yeah, like so, it's a vacation at Costco just here. See if this fits your lifestyle. Yeah, it's really sad. And in the back of, you know, sometimes these are in the back of, uh, you know, you see these brochures in the back of churches and it'll say there's, there's a brochure that one of the dioceses has. It's called select. It says on the front, selecting the grounds as though we're picking out coffee. Selecting the grounds, like how many boxes we can check. And some of these brochures are, are pretty bad. So they'll say, well, you know, back when you got married, what was your state of mind? What, what about this? What about that? Seriously, 30 Heart, 31 years ago, that's a, long, that's a long time. And some people have their marriages annulled well beyond that, that, that time frame. So my argument to begin with is, look, what happened to reconciliation? What happened to saying, okay, if your marriage weren't valid, let, let, if you have some doubt about that, well, let's, you know, let's, let's you know, fix that. You know, there's a right. procedure for doing that. But I think that, that that is why I say that, that the betrayed without a kiss is, is, is appropriate. It, I, do I like saying that? I do not. I am a. I go to daily mass. I mean, I'm in Florida, so unless there's a hurricane, we're at least and I are daily mass. So yeah, that's what I want. I just simply want to see that that matrimony treated as a sacrament, 
And I think that it's we've 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 largely the leadership of the church, not not every member of the leadership, of course, but the leadership of the church has largely failed in the respect to protect the sacrament of matrimony. Sean, where did you see or could you pinpoint maybe a, just in the timeline in the last 60 years, maybe where did you see this change either in your own experience or in interviews that annulments it, it, almost like like abortion on the Democratic platform, safe, legal and rare, right? Um, annulments used to be that sort of, well, we don't like them, but they're there. And mm -hmm. yet now they are part of mainstream conversations about marriage in the Catholic Church. Where did you see this sea change, the shift in attitudes towards their frequency? Well, that's really the question, right? So it's a great question. Um, so in the late 1960s, uh, there were approximately per year about 350 annulments, you know, as an annual number, 350. Wow. By the late 80s, it had grown to 70,000 annually. So you're talking about a number going from 350 to 70,000 within basically 30 years, right? Oh, or I'm sorry, less than that. It'd be, even, it'd be less than that. It'd be more like two decades, right? About 20 years. So the reason that I started writing this book was that a friend of mine was going through, uh, you know, potential divorce and he started asking my advice and I, and he would mention things to me like, well, you know, in the church, you know, in most dioceses, you have to get, I think it's every diocese actually, you have to get a civil divorce prior to an annulment hearing. So you have to come in divorced civilly before you can determine if your marriage is sacramentally valid. Now oh that's God. actually exactly right. It's, sho it's shocking. Like it, when he first, when he told me, I didn't believe him. I said, I said that that can't be right. Well, of course it is correct. Oh. Where it all began was uh, in the late 1960s, there was a petition to adopt what's called the American procedural norms. And I go into some detail about the book. There's, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of detail, but suffice it to say that the American procedural norms made it easier to uh, have a finding of nullity, mm -hmm. right? Annulment is not a great word, actually, because it, it, finding of nullity is a, it's much more technically accurate. So um, that basically did it. So the so so within a year following the adoption of the American procedural norms, the numbers went up. Uh, I believe uh, over five thousand in the year following. So in other words, you went almost immediately from three hundred and fifty to over five thousand. And so that to me was the key thing. But then. What tends to, what happened from there was they were just getting started because then, as as I just mentioned, it, it rose to over seventy thousand in a year. So you're talking about having, if you think about the math there, you talk about having one hundred and forty thousand because you have two people in marriage, obviously, right? You have one hundred and forty thousand people have their marriage annulled in a year. That's what word should we use for that? Because I don't think staggering quite does it. You're you're talking about the, the numbers are. They're, they're frankly shocking. Mm. And so what's the response been? Well, so far, the response of uh, many of the bishops has not been what's going on. In other words, you and I are harassed, having a conversation like, well, what's going on? Well, that's a really good conversation to have, right? And yet I wonder if that actually goes on. And I, and I think ultimately what happens is, is that I think that, you know, people come in to uh, their parish to speak to the priest. And I think maybe they've had the civil divorce and then they want to go back to mass. And then it's a conversation of, well, maybe we can, maybe we can, you know, get, get an annulment through. Mm -hmm. I think that that's probably how many of these begin. Mm. Here's the problem. Matrimony, you know, we have that scene in the gospels, a recount of the gospels where Jesus institutes the Eucharist and many people walk away and he turns to the apostles and asks them if they're going to leave too. And of course, we know, you know, the, the answer of the apostles. And ultimately, many people regarded the Eucharist as a difficult teaching. It's a hard teaching, right? right. Now, the sacraments are, are beautiful teaching, but they can be hard teachings. Many people don't like, they don't enjoy going to confession. Hmm. So the idea that that is the normal way for God to forgive sins, it's a hard teaching for them. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful teaching, but it could be a hard teaching. And so... The job of, of the leadership of the church is to stand by the sacraments, 
And whether that strikes one as a beautiful heart to sing, because if you simply are not following the sacraments uh, and defending them with everything you can, uh, it creates a lot of chaos. So uh, to, to put it mildly, so that, that's essentially the problem. But I, I just gave you the long answer to the question. But largely, it was, in the, it was in the late 1960s. I would also stress that a lot of times people sort of lay the problem at the, at the feet of the Second Vatican Council. In this particular case, um, that, is actually, that actually was not the impetus for the changes. It was the American procedural norms. Mm. You might say that it was you know, the sort of the spirit of Vatican II. But really, if you're looking at the documents, and I go over this in detail, um, the Second Vatican Council could have phrased things more clearly, mm -hmm. but marriage was not redefined by the Second mm -hmm. Vatican Council. It was simply, and so, and again, you don't see the numbers go right from you know the mid '60s. It was the late '60s in 1970 where we started to see the numbers increase. Also, if we're if we're in the '60s, we'll stay there for a minute. We'll talk about Humanae Vitae, of course, Pope Paul VI's encyclical on human life and marriage and contraception, largely, and the mm -hmm. rejection of it. I. I had known this maybe on the periphery, but reading your book really brought it into such clarity. The rejection of Humanae Vitae came from within the church. Mm -hmm. it, came, this, it came from a professor at the Catholic University of America, and it didn't, it didn't stop there, certainly. Tell us a bit about that. So you had a lot of dissent, but, but probably the, the, um, the most vocal dissenter was named Father Charles Curran, uh, taught at Catholic University. And I believe it was the day Humanae Vitae was released. It might have been the day after. It was like 24 hours after the release of Humanae Vitae. Um, he took objection to it, called the press, and said, you know, he didn't, he didn't buy into it. The thing we have to remember about Humanae Vitae is, is that Humanae Vitae was simply restating what the church had taught since, uh, uh, you know, many things, since the ink was dry, as Dr. William Marshall puts it, since the ink was, before the ink was dry in the New Testament. The church has <laughs> held this. Held this. Mm -hmm. And so for him to say, well, I don't like what's being taught. Well, his problem wasn't with Humanae Vitae so much as it was with scripture, tradition, Casti Canubi, uh, you know, half a dozen cyclicals, um, you know, again, the fathers of the church. So, but anyway, in any case, Father Charles Kern took it upon himself to raise a stink when it came to uh, dissenting with Humanae Vitae. A lot of other priests joined in. Um the, the interesting thing about that for our purposes of this book here would be is that uh, the church has consistently maintained infallibly uh, that the primary purpose of matrimony is the, is the procreation and education of children. So when you have an objection to humanae vitae, you're essentially, your, your ultimate objection is not to an encyclical, it's to the sacrament of matrimony itself. And that's the key part here. So if you're not really going to going along with it, um, there there is where the problem lies. But but Father Curran was not alone. This became a very popular opinion. Um, and when we go back to the title of my book, we might consider the fact that uh, Father Curran could have been fired. In fact, I think I think they tried to fire him, and then there was a student protest or something, and he stayed on for teaching another twenty years or so. Well, that's twenty years worth of heresy. How do you, so how do you bounce back from that? So I think that there was a failure to police. There was a failure on the part of the, uh, the American bishops to police heretics. And sadly, it wasn't the only case, but it was certainly, that was, that was a significant problem. John, you make a, a great connection in the book between frequency, disbelief, and respect for all of the sacraments and that mm -hmm. you can't have disrespect and disbelief in one sacrament happen without a correlation with another one or with all of them. And your primary ones here are between the Eucharist and marriage. Go into that for us. So ultimately, uh, I would look at it this way. So it's very simple. Words matter. So are we are we saying that words matter or that they do not? So uh, I do matters. This is my body matters. And I think ultimately, you know, right now we are seeing a, uh, a crisis in the, a crisis in Eucharistic belief. I think that's fair to say. Um, and so, yeah, I've seen different numbers. A third of, you know, Catholics don't believe in the Eucharist. Two thirds don't believe in the real presence, whatever the numbers are. The numbers are, if they're at all, if they're there at all, the numbers are high. But the problem is, is that when you're not defending 
one sacrament, you're really not defending any of the seven, right? Uh, the seven sacraments, uh, they're symbiotic. They, they, that's, that's how they're structured. And so when you create a confusion, uh, at, at least, with the sacrament of matrimony, you're like, well, was it valid? We don't want to leave the faithful in a position where they're asking questions like, was that sacrament valid? That's very, that's very bad. That's not the way that Jesus drew this up. And so that creates a, a huge worry. It's a huge, it's a huge concern for the faithful, but ultimately it comes down to this one thing. Words matter. This is my body. This is my blood. Those words matter. And the connection between the Eucharist, and by the way, I, I, I should say that I actually believe that the best part of this book is the part that I didn't write. Uh, it was it was a foreword written by uh, Catherine Godfrey Howell, who has a who is a doctorate in canon law, and she actually goes through this um, very clearly, uh, very succinctly. It's a beautiful foreword, uh, and she talks about this in detail: the connection between the Eucharist and matrimony, and it's it's you know it's beautiful. And I'm hoping that the powers that be actually see that connection because I think that so right now we have a Eucharistic revival going on in the church, but. I think that if that is not accompanied by a matrimonial revival, I don't think it bears much fruit. I don't want to say that, but I think that's reality. And I, because I think that people get that idea. And the problem now is, of course, is not uh, as, you know, they say that there aren't as many annulments as there used to be. Yeah, that's true. There are also far fewer marriages. Marriages. <laughs> exactly. Right. And so there are fewer marriages to annul. And, you know, at the, uh, I highlighted the book that that you know within my lifetime or so, uh, there were over four hundred thousand marriages annually in the Catholic Church. In the year twenty twenty, there were less than one hundred thousand. So you're talking about seventy five percent fewer marriages today or in twenty twenty than than there were fifty years prior. That's a problem. So people say, well, there are fewer annulments now. <laughs> of course. I mean, mm. right at a certain point, there there just are fewer words to annul, so it's a problem. And so, what does that tell me? It tells me that many people, many of the lady, aren't even taking marriage seriously. They're not taking it seriously because it didn't seem to be taken very seriously when it came to annulling. Am right. I should I get married if we're just going to get this annulled anyway? And it's a problem. People aren't getting married, so yeah, the, the numbers are there. Yeah. What's the point? That's right. Talking about people preparing for marriage and the so-called pre pre Cana programs across the, the country. I'm sure there are great ones, but there mm -hmm. are a lot of really awful ones as well. I remember the people, the couple that did the pre cana for my future husband and I told us that we didn't have to be open to life as long as we were open to being generous with our community and being oh, nice. generous in friendships. Right. Isn't that really good? Yeah. Really sound. Yeah. Heartwarming. So, well, heartwarming. Yeah. So much, so much diversity, so much justice, so much compassion, and yet no dogma. Um, Jaw-droppingly bad stuff across the country. How do people like that find themselves in charge of pre-Cana programs in our American diocese? So there was a, there was a, I don't know what you'd call this, maybe like a trial balloon for uh, expanding pre-Cana to like 16 months or, or 18 months or something. It was pretty long, but let's do a long pre-Cana because it was basically the way that it was marketed or, or at least suggested would have been that it is a um, uh, sort of a way to evangelize, which I, I get the idea. I get the good intention. But the problem is, is that we people have a natural law right to marriage. And I don't, and I, I, by the way, I don't think that 16 months is, is fair for lack of a better word. I don't think it's just, mm -hmm. um, these are two people in love. The fact of the matter is, is that if the primary purpose of marriage is the procreation and education of children, why are we waiting six months to begin? You know, I wrote a piece in the register, uh, some years ago and I was married. I was only 21 which I guess is, I guess is young. It didn't feel young. Honestly, I met the girl <laughs> I loved and I wanted, I would have gotten married at 18, but you know, I mm -hmm. went to college and whatever, but I got married at 21 and people sometimes think, well, that's really young. And they'll, 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 they're not shy. A lot of times people are not shy about telling you, mm -hmm. um, but you know, and then they'll say, well, you know, do you have the money? Do you have this and that? And, and ultimately 
what they're really objecting to, I think, in a way is, well, you might have a lot of kids. I, I At least that's what I was hearing. Like, you might, you know, you might have a lot of children. Well, Lisa and I understood very well that the primary purpose of marriage was the procreation and education of children. We understood that quite well. And we wanted to get on with it. And we have nine children, so I guess we did a pretty decent job. <laughs> but the point is, is that to wait 16 months, uh, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that follows the natural law. What I would say is this. I actually think, and I outline this in the book, as you know, that pre-Cana should start in a cradle. Mm. My, my parents, uh, who were married uh, decades there, if I had to say, well, who taught me pre-Cana? Was it the priest? By the way, I love the priest that taught her pre-Cana. Was it the priest that met with us three or four Tuesdays in a row and went over some things? I, I think he did a great job. But but primarily my pre-Cana was my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. It was it was watching a, a husband and wife in love whose love brought forth children. And I probably couldn't told it told you much about matrimony when I was in my my crib. But what I did see is two people that love each other that seem very intent on caring for me. And I think that so the pre cana starts very early. And if our job is to teach people about marriage, I really think that that has to count from the pulpit teaching young, uh, young men and young women what to look for in a spouse. I don't remember hearing this sermon. And yet, I mean, I've been going to mass a while now. And I don't remember ever hearing a sermon about that. Here's what you should look for in a spouse. It seems to me that's a very fruitful sermon. I mean, especially when, you know, when, when the when the gospel is, you know, the wedding feast at Cana or there's something pertaining to marriage. Why not have that? There's your pre-Cana. By the way, if you're waiting till a few, well, 16 months is too long, but typically if you're waiting, let's say six months to do your pre-Cana, you should have already known at that point what, a, a suitable, a good spouse look, looked like, right? Right. You follow me? So, so I really think that in terms of saying, no, 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 we, they're, they're engaged now. We, we should wait 16 months and make sure they know their faith. Well, making sure they know their faith, should, that should have been going on their whole lives, right? This is <laughs> like, this is a new thing. Are we going to teach them about marriage now? I don't think that's fair to them. I mm -hmm. think you want to teach them how to, how to be virtuous yourself. In other words, if I were hearing that, if I were in the pew, Listen to that sermon. Uh, here's what you young ladies should look for in a young man. I'd want to be that young man. I, I would I would feel, you know, compelled to like, OK, how do I live more virtuously? What? How do I how do I become right. that? I just right. think we should concentrate on that more. So mm. to the myriad of problems surrounding <laughs> marriage annulments, marriage prep, does it feel too overwhelming of a problem? for it that you to see addressed by at the Episcopate in the U S by the bishops, by your local parish priests. How do you start to fix this problem that is so just endemic and large in the culture? Well, that's the trick, but the, but the, here's what we know for sure. We know for sure that sacraments don't break. So that means that matrimony is not broken that we know. So what does that mean? It means the system is is faulty. That means somewhere along the way, something is not going the way that it should be. I think that's fair to say. So there is a way to solve this 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 issue in large measure. Um, one of the things that we really need to do is get the priests more involved with 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 the couples uh, in their young married lives, and that doesn't mean just meeting with them a few times before they're married. I think it's great the priests meet. A lot of times they really don't, or it's sort of a very informal type of thing. But, you know, the priests have to be involved. Uh, it's a great time for a priest to recommend, um, you know, that the couple go to confession. It's a great time uh, to get to know them. Uh, I think they should, you know, the priest should remain um, in their lives uh, in the first few years to, like, bless their homes. You know, I mentioned this in the, in the book, and I hope that people realize this is a, I think this is a pretty valuable suggestion. The blessing of the homes used to be, it was pretty common. Now it's really rare. Um, I think that should be something. Uh, I think there's that. I think that, um, you know, staying with a couple and trying to help them live sacramental lives is good. I think the priestly involvement is good. I mean, again, look, I'm a, you know, I'm a solid, I'm a Roman, uh, you know, um, 
I should say I'm a solid Catholic. Uh, you know, as a minister, we go to daily mass. I love priests. I want them more involved in in the in in lives. I think that's a key part of this. Um, I think structurally, uh, and the bishops of America could take this as as a bit of a, a bit of a friendly challenge. Um, please explain why it is that there is a divorce mandate. I, I want to know why there is a civil divorce mandate prior to hearing uh, the annulment. Because I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. How it, if reconciliation is possible, and I think that many times it is. Um, it strikes me that that's awfully hard after you've gotten a civil divorce. For one, a contentious divorce is probably going to run, what, $100,000, maybe more. It's not cheap. Right. Especially in the, and in the age of, you know, unilateral divorce, it makes it trickier. So there's that. So there are structural things we can do. Um, again, from the pulpit, a key thing. The There has to be uh, some talk from the pulpit about why matrimony is good, why it's great. The, the fact that God loves marriage. God hates divorce. We know that. It's in the Bible. God loves marriage. How do we know he loves marriage? Well, if you start, if you go back to the Old Testament, so when I started this book, by the way, to try to get a sense of like how God designed marriage, I thought it would be a good idea to, uh, let's go all the way back. Let's go back to the garden, right? And God loves marriage and he's, you know, Adam, you know, feels a sense of loneliness and then, and then, and then Eve is created. So it's actually very beautiful in the sense that in a lot of ways, but consider that one, so one flesh becomes, uh, becomes two and then two becomes one. It's beautiful. <laughs> Hmm. We have to talk about that. We have to emphasize the fact that that God loves marriage. And then we go, obviously, um, Adam and Eve uh, messed up pretty badly and, uh, you know, creation fell. But, you know, it's interesting, too, when you read the Old Testament the thing that that that's that really uh, stood out to me as I did my research is, is that as bad as things were around them. I mean, you want to talk about a tumultuous relationship. I mean, Adam and Eve, I mean, that's. That's pretty rough. I mean, it, creation <laughs> fell. And but, you know, what's interesting is they never got divorced and they don't ever seem mm. to have considered divorce. And I say in the book, I think that they always remembered how great marriage could be. Mm. So we go from that story, we go to the New Testament. In the New Testament, um, the Gospel of John. Uh, so essentially, we're opening up at a wedding scene. We have a wedding at Cana. We don't know the name of the couple interesting um we do know that from the beginning of the the husband and wife's life together christ was at the center he was literally present at their wedding in the east in the eastern church lisa and i are um we're married in the eastern right and uh the first thing we do with that ceremony is that we walk we put on we we put on crowns and we walk around the gospel book Literally, we walk around the gospel. So the got to remind us just at the very beginning, the gospel is the center of our lives. But we go to the, at, at, the, at the gospel of John. Mary says they have no wine. Now, Mary knows something is going. Mary knows that if Jesus begins his public life, that is the beginning of his road to Calvary. And yet she asks him. And Jesus turns water into wine. So we know that Jesus loves marriage. We know that Mary loves marriage. And one of the great things that I think is so important for us to focus on, um, particularly in an age that is, um, it's so difficult in so many ways, but it, it's, no, it's no secret uh, that we live in a pornographic age. How do you get out of it? You have a devotion to Mary. Hmm. You, you, you turn to Our Lady. This is key. This is what we all should be doing. But I think we have to remember that from the pulpit, what we need to hear is God loves marriage. I don't remember ever hearing, and maybe I forgot that's maybe I forgot a priest saying that I don't remember a priest ever saying God loves marriage. Why? Why aren't we hearing that? Why are we hearing that five or ten times a year? Why are we thinking? Why are we talking about that? In the book, I, I talk uh, a lot about the book of Tobias and uh, or the book of Tobit, I should say, and Tobias yeah. and Sarah and, and their wedding, um, because that really shows us what would happen to a wedding, to a marriage. If you go back and look at the question. What if Adam had cast the serpent out? He could have done it. What if Adam had said, no, you, no, there, no, you cannot, you, you're not going to break our marriage up, which is clearly what the serpent was trying to do. The serpent mm -hmm. was trying to break up a marriage. 
Mm. That's that's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. So so what um, what Tobias uh, is doing in that, and I go into detail about the book of Tobias. It's a it's a beautiful, it's beautiful. Uh, sadly, uh, the book of the book of Tobit is not read uh, on any Sunday, I believe, in the current calendar. It's read every three years, and I think that's only part of it. I think part really? of it is 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 taken out. Yes, mm -hmm. and I talk about that in the book. That should be at least once a year. We talk about that because because Tobias essentially cast a demon out uh, that wanted to wreck his marriage, and the de the demon never came back, and they lived a happy life, and it was it was great. But we need to we need to focus on that. God loves marriage. We need to, we need to hear that, and we mm -hmm. we 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 desperately need to hear the positives. It's not just you know. That's one of the that's one of my my hopes for this book is that um, this is not a book about annulments per se. Yes, it's in there. I, I go over that. The longest chapter is about annulments because I think that is it's a very significant problem. My 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 belief though my my stance is not that no marriage should ever have resulted in a finding of nullity. Okay. I, I think that there were marriages out there. Yes, properly speaking, there should be a finding of nullity. It shouldn't be 70,000. Mm. But my position is, is that, that um, there, are, there are relationships that are reconcilable. Uh, there are, we need to know about the goods of marriage. We need to know about the beauty of marriage. And we need to hear about it from the priests. We need to hear about it from the bishops. And I can, I can, talk and you know uh, you know talk about how great marriage is that's 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 fine i hope people get a lot out of that i hope i inspire people but the fact of the matter is is that if the church is going to change on this the leadership of the church is going to change we need to hear it from the priests priests need to tell us how great marriage is they they should know this this is a sacrament i have to keep in mind this is a sacrament and so we need to hear about the beauty of the sacrament i had a reading for the book of tobit at my wedding i am proud to say beautiful excellent Excellent. Again, the book is Betrayed Without a Kiss, Defending Marriage After Years of Failed Leadership in the Church. You can find it here on tanbooks.com or at your local Catholic bookseller. John, congratulations on this powerful book. Very timely for our culture today. I hope some of those bishops are watching this or listening and pick up some things that we, our couples, so desperately need to hear today, all of our families. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate it so much. Mm -hmm.